Okay, welcome everyone to Positive Luxury's Future of Sustainable Sourcing webinar. Uh, thank you for taking time out of your busy day to join us today. Um, if you haven't joined a Positive Luxury webinar before, then a warm welcome to you. Um, our webinar will take the format of approximately 30 minutes discussion followed by 10 minutes of Q&A. Um, please do post your questions in the chat tab and the panel will do their very best to work through them at the end of the discussion. Um, for over 10 years now, Positive Luxury have been helping organisations adapt to the new climate economy. Our ESG Plus framework is the only sustainability assessment tailored for luxury industry and has a unique focus on innovation. And the brands, retailers and suppliers that we certify receive the butterfly mark, which is a globally respected trust mark that is independent evidence of their positive impact on nature and society. And this webinar forms part of Positive Luxury's knowledge program, which is designed to highlight key issues that face us, offer expert viewpoints and offer tools for businesses to take positive action. If you haven't already done so, then I do encourage you to download the insightful and complimentary report that accompanies this webinar at www.positiveluxury.com and the link will be posted shortly in the webinar chat. Um, now we're entering a new, enter, a new era of accountability and transparency, but with 90% of brand resource consumption taking place in the supply chain, uh, much of this is going unpublished and therefore isn't transparent and we still have a long way to go. So Positive Luxury believe that we need a new era of collaboration between suppliers and brands. Brands can no longer separate their business operation from that of their suppliers. And suppliers, on the other hand, should prepare for increased expectations from brands uh, for their suppliers to help them achieve their goals. So it's time to embrace suppliers as partners and not simply sources and vice versa. I'm really excited to introduce our brilliant panel today who will explore why this is an imperative and they'll outline the many benefits and the value of this collaboration and how we can all help accelerate, make it happen. So I'd like to introduce uh, Frédéric Dufour, President and CEO of the world's first champagne house, Winois. Phil Wilde, CEO of James Cropper PLC, the world-class advanced material and paper company, providing solutions to luxury across the globe. And of course, Martin Townsend, Global Head of Sustainability and Circular Economy at BSI. Uh, and finally, um, last but not least, your host today, Positive Luxury co-founder and co-CEO, Diana Verdinetto. Um, so without further ado, I'll hand you over to Diana. Thank you so much, Jamie, and welcome. Um, it's a real honor to uh, spend the next 45 minutes in conversation with you. Um, and I'd like to start uh, basically by setting an example, because actually we work very closely with BSI, British Standard Institution, who, who um, has helped us to co-create our framework and also um, at the same time, make sure that we comply with the highest standards which are governed by the institution. And Martin, I mean, I'd like to start to, to chat with you because you have an, you had had an incredible year last year. We went to, you went to COP and I mean, all the insights you come with was like really mind blowing. And I'd like to share with the audience um, I mean, one of the conversations that we had is about this idea of acceleration for disclosure and collaboration as a must have. And basically, this is not an option any longer. So I was wondering if you can share with the audience what are the three trends that you're seeing right now here in the luxury space um, in, relationship, in relationship with this relationship between suppliers and brands and also uh, with the global north and the global south. Cool. What a question to start with. I love the way that you've wrapped a really complicated question in a very simple wrapper um, in terms of those trends. I suppose to start, it's important that we just don't see this as a B2B conversation, but a B2C as well, because actually the consumer is becoming incredibly powerful now in terms of shaping that kind of supplier um, relationship. So I think we need to kind of think about that. And in that process, I think that the consumer is really making sustainability the choice. Uh, there was an interesting statistic from, um, from Gartner the other day about 75% of consumers are thinking about sustainability when they're making their decisions about products and services. 
the the other kind of marker to put down, I think, is also um, uh, the Larry Fink letter, which is the CEO of BlackRock, where he is really sort of putting down a line to say what are the things that are really mattering in the boardroom, what really matter in the boardroom. And I think if we kind of use the report that was mentioned at the start, transparency, I think, is incredibly important. Transparency will drive lots of the conversations with brands and suppliers now. And in that, we need to make sure, as was suggested, this collaborative model in terms of how do we share our risk, how do we collaborate and innovate together will be important. But I think fundamental as well is this issue about risk management and ESG. How do we really understand who our suppliers are, what they're doing through the lens of ESG, and how do we really make sure that we can do something really quite powerful in that conversation? And I think, you know, if I think about the discussions I've had this week, this month, this year so far, it has all been about supply chains and scope three emissions. Things like reverse bidding becomes really important. How can I get the quality of the service that I want with the lowest possible impact? So I think there's a lot of issues around risk management and ESG, how collaboration will drive change by shared risk, driven by transparency from the business to the consumer and all the parts in between. So I think there's a, there's a great conversation we're going to have today. I already know that because we've had a little bit of a chat before we started. So I know everybody's in a, in a collaborative mood already. Thank you very much. And absolutely, I mean, what we're seeing at Positive Luxury is how companies are looking to internalize the externalities, and that's obviously the value chain. I personally don't particularly like the word suppliers. I like the word partners, because really is no longer uh, a something that is it's somewhere that you don't see. It has to be something that, you know, is somebody real that you collaborate and you co-create. And this is why I'm very excited to have Frederick and, and, and Phil uh, as well in this conversation. So, I mean, Frederick, Reynard is uh, one of the oldest champagne, or if not the oldest champagne house in the world, a traditional house with a modern twist. Um, and sustainability, I know firsthand, because we know, we know each other for a long time, is very high in your agenda and you're very passionate about that, which is, you know, leading from the top with an example is fantastic. So what, um, uh, I mean, could you share uh, what are the sustainability projects that are being uh, close to your heart and you have been uh, working on the last few years um, that you feel the proudest? Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe, uh, thank you, Diana. And uh, let, me, let me say maybe a few words of introduction on maybe why is it so fundamental for, for us, for the industry and for us at Renard in particular, be, before jumping right away to the uh, to the project. Uh, basically, yeah, we are the first established our first champagne, 1729. So, you know, we have almost three centuries of existence and therefore for us, you know, time has a different meaning than most of the industries. Uh, you know, for just for developing a new idea or new new product, normally would take at least five to 10 years, if not more. So that also, you know, is very important in this, uh, in this way that we look at sustainability. Uh, uh, moreover, as you all know, 100% uh, of the product is coming from the vineyards, right? So earth is at the very, uh, very heart of our industry. And, you know, everything pro is produced from the land in, uh, of Champagne. So I, I, would, um, I would summarize these this few words by saying that viticulture which is key for us, of course, is a long-term end behavior and is intrinsically linked to the well-being of the planet. So on, from both sides, you know, sustainability is a must. However, not all champagne brands maybe are as uh, embracing it as, as we are. So for us, it's a, probably a mix of, you know, we are the first house uh, of champagne, as I said, and therefore we really feel that there is a responsibility uh, for us to lead champagne or to be one of the house definitely who is leading champagne in that way. And what we wanted to add on, on the, the project that we will uh, focus on is really a, a fantastic example is, we, we want, I mean, we are the corner of wine industry and luxury industry. And what we really wanted to add to the luxury component is, is really the, um, uh, the consciousness. Because, you know, time and excellence is, 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 uh, is luxury. Everybody agrees. But not everybody agrees or feels that luxury and conscious can go well together. 
uh, even if now, of course, you know, most people would probably agree. But, you know, back a few years ago, it was very, uh, it was very uh, maybe new at that time. So uh, we did a lot of things because, uh, you know, it's nice to have a vision. It's nice to be, you know, to be convinced, but it's something else to act because we need to act, you know, all of us on very quickly and, and you know, and it takes time. So what did we do? We started basically in a vineyard because, you know, again, you know, that's where the product comes from. And we have certification and it's not the, the focus of the conversation today. But let's not forget that, you know, the heart of everything is how do we uh, do we uh, uh, work on the vineyards every single day? But about 10 years ago, what we did, we, we really wanted to work extensively uh, reducing the carbon footprint on the whole value chain that you that you just mentioned. And if I if I uh, uh, give you a few examples, I mean we've reviewed all the energy uh, contracts for the production facilities. They are all uh, green energy now, uh, sourcing green energy. We have changed all the lead, of course. We are recycling. It's not carbon footprint, but extremely important for us as well. We are re recycling 99.7 percent of all our waste on our on our different sites. We uh, something which is extremely important that I think is not having the right focus today. We did stop the transportation of our products for uh, in, uh, using plane in 2015. You still, you know, you still hear so many companies uh, shipping that product plane, which is a disaster for the planet. And, and we've stopped that uh, in 2015. And we're working since 2016 on something very tricky, which is the last mile, you know, on how to work with on partnership here. Uh, you know, is another partnership that we have with with, uh, with a company in France, uh, Labatu, which is the most advanced because you know you need to work together. Uh, we've we've stopped plastic and you know we've done uh, several things. And uh, last but not least, we wanted to work, of course, on the packaging. And this is the you know what we want to focus here today. Uh, packaging is uh, the third um, uh, reason for for the carbon footprint or the the, the third. Uh, um, I don't find the proper word at the moment, but you know the, the third most important uh, carbon footprint emission uh, uh, reason. So what we did is first we did uh, redesign the existing gift boxes, the traditional gift boxes that everybody knows, rectangular, uh, heavy, uh, mixed plastic on, 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 on paper. And that was uh, back in 2012, 2014. And we redesigned all of them. And we had uh, we came up with a with a gift box which was uh, the cleanest at that time and would probably be still the cleanest of the industry today, but we felt in 2015 that we needed to go one step further. And this is really the the second skin uh, story. Um, we we saw that we were at the limit of what us on our suppliers at that time we probably we were we were talking about suppliers much more we were at the limit of uh, of, of 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 solution existing solution so so we challenge ourselves and we said we need to challenge the way the use the usage completely the you know the full the full package of the gift box and um we came up with the first drawing, which is which was very far from uh, what uh, what you know today, but which was the idea of molding, you know, uh, uh, something light uh, made of paper uh, around the around the bottle. Um, two years of uh, research and development later, uh, seven prototypes later, and thanks to the very strong cooperation with two uh, two partners, actually. We had uh, Pusterla, which is, uh, you know, one of our uh, long, uh, long time Italian packaging expert. And with uh, Phil and his team, with just Cop James Copper, which was our paper expert partner that we, you know, I think it was the first time that, uh, you know, uh, uh, they were uh, working with uh, with with Moet Tennessee, our, our shareholder. And uh, this is how we develop the, the second skin as we know it today. Uh, nine times lighter, 60% less uh, carbon footprint, 100% uh, paper issued from uh, eco-managed uh, European forest. Uh, and I want to insist on that with uh, a production which is efficient or sustainable, and I'm sure that Phil, uh, you know, will tell you a lot about it, which was extremely important to us because, you know, it's uh, it's not only working on, on, on the solution, but who will make, you know, the solution happen and what are their values. And also, um, uh, also want to insist on a beautiful, elegant, sensual solution, so we could demonstrate that again, luxury and eco-consciousness 
was was possible. And I think it was probably one of the first example of the luxury industry to be able to demonstrate uh, this uh, uh, that that it was possible. And, thank you and, so. Yeah, oh. Thank you, thank you, Diana. No, no, no. It's okay. Sorry to interrupt you. I said thank you very much. And um, you know, I, w I still remember when I went to your office uh, just before Christmas, and you were so excited uh, to show me, uh, you know, kind of the, the the first the first iteration of it. And um, yeah, that was a very special, very special moment. And I mean. Feel clearly you are the man of the day today, uh, the man of the match, as they say. And, uh, you know, um, James Cropper has a history of innovation and disruption, very similar to the same stance that Rena does. Um, so it would be really uh, interesting to hear your other side of the story. Um, so what are the challenges that you overcame to, to meet the client's expectations and to actually come up with something so, uh, you know, so, so groundbreaking, really. So um, let me start by, uh, again, like Frederick, just a very brief introduction. So uh, James Cropper is, uh, actually, James Cropper is quite young in compared to uh, to Runar. Uh, Runar are about to celebrate 300 years, and, and we are a mere near close to 200 years. So between our, between our two companies, we're, uh, we're at half, half a millennia. Um, <laughs> And, you know, there's a lot of common values between Ruinar and, uh, and James Cropper, particularly when it comes to luxury, um, authenticity, and great heritage. The piece that really stands out for, for both organisations is the spirit of innovation. And you can, you know, and Frederick has very sort of clearly uh, talked about that in terms of the, the evolution and um and uh, the change of moving away from something that is quite traditional, and uh, and Frederick, I have I have one of the boxes here, um, and you uh, and you talked about, uh, uh, and this is one of the older versions, um, a very elegant, very well designed um, point of sale box, but but it's you know it's mixed materials. Uh, in there is plastic. There's adhesives. Um, and it's and it becomes more challenging to uh, to recycle, and so you know uh, there's the project that uh, that we ran with, which was the uh, and it's actually a, it's the picture above Frederick's head. I'm very proud of that picture, Frederick. So uh, um, yeah, I'm pleased to say I've got the real thing here as well. <laughs> um, but to to run with the project of the of the second skin, yeah. You know, and Frederick talked about. You know, it's it's sixty percent less less carbon footprint. It's nine times lighter. It's what we call mono material, which means that it is one single material that's uh, that's used all from all from FSC uh, wood pulp and uh, and so on. But you know, and Frederick touched on this, but this is uh, about sustainably having a very authentic uh, product. But but this is a point of sale item as uh, as well. And so, you know, being able to, you know, to create the design on the surface, and that design is, is actually, it's a digit, it's an embossed, uh, but it's a digital image of the cellars where the champagne is, uh, is stored. Um, and, uh, and Frederick talked about nine versions, and I, and I think we were, we were pretty close to nine versions of having a, a securing mechanism that, you know, that opens the bottle in, in a way that you can you know you can open and close it you know many many times more times than you would you would ever need and it also has that sort of satisfaction click when you uh, when you close it so it gives it gives the uh, uh, supports the whole luxury um, um, feel uh, and ambience around the you know the product itself and that was probably one of the biggest challenges that uh, that we had because you know, a, a second skin in its very, very raw form um, is is like is like an egg box. But what we've created is something that's really put a lot of science in there, uh, design in there, and capability in there in order to create something that is absolutely luxury and fit for a brand such as uh, such as Runa. Thank you very much. And I'm sure that you have challenges. Um, so what I would like to know from both of you, Phil and Frederick, uh, where did you compromise? 
did you have to compromise in your vision at all? And also, you know, what have you learned? Uh, what are the things that you can actually pass along? Because that's what everybody wants to know. How can we actually emulate what you have, the relationship that you have to land this in a, such a beautiful, successful, uh, innovative packaging? And actually, you're still talking to each other. So, I mean, how did you do this? Uh, well, if I, if I start, I think um, for me, there are two points. Definitely no compromise. And it, it did work because once again, we, we, we selected um, uh, to work with James Cropper because of its values, because they were, again, the same vision, the same values that we have, sustainability in all they do. And Phil has an, you know, uh, uh, tell you the story about, you know, the solar panel that they use on the water, which is even cleaner. At the, so, you know, the whole process, absolutely, uh, you know, conscious. And, and that for us was was critical and therefore when you have the same values i think you know it's so easy or much easier it's never easy but much easier to work together on the second one it's about time um, you know uh, we would have compromised if we would have um, uh, released the second skin version i don't know two or three but we had those seven prototypes and at the end we thought that's that's what we want. So we had, I mean, we had time. We took time because we thought it had to be perfect because the challenge was was high. I mean, killing a gift box, you don't know how many people saw that we were crazy. You know, uh, people are using gift boxes for the past 200 years. Actually, it's Ruinard, 200 years ago, who initiated the gift box concept. So, you know, we had to kill that uh, that idea. So, you you know, it was it was a high risk. So we needed to succeed with something perfect. And we knew that uh, with such a partner, we would we would uh, achieve it. Thank you. Sorry. Phil, what about from your side? Yeah, I, I agree. And, you know, two years and, and seven variations to, to get to this point. And, you know, I don't believe the product has been uh, compromised. But there were there were learnings on on route as we uh, as we did that. And, you know, an example is the uh, the Blanc, uh, the Blanc, the Blanc, which actually is uh, is this one. It's a it's a clear bottle, and uh, you know sunlight can can come through packaging, and it has the uh, the ability to uh, to potentially degrade the product that's uh, that's in there. So it's really important to have a uh, a package in there that is also protecting the uh, the wine, the sparkling wine, the champagne that's that's there. And so we did quite a lot of trials of uh, putting mineral additives in uh, mm -hmm. in order to, uh, to protect that. And we achieved that. And it, and it was important to do it in the way that we did in a sustainable way, because mm -hmm. there could have been synthetic products that, uh, that we put in there that, that, that would have done the same job. We managed to find a, an additive and a mineral, which also allows the product to be totally recyclable, repulpable after that, uh, after that process as, uh, as well. And as uh, and as Frederick talks about, you know, the uh, not necessarily the challenge, but the collaboration of you know, this does need to be authentic. And so one of the uh, reviews that we undertake as we go through this is a life cycle analysis mm -hmm. of really understanding you know, what it is that we're doing. And you know, Frederick uh, alluded to it. Our colour form business, is, which, which is one of our three businesses and the, and the business that, uh, that supports this project. Now it is a, is a hundred percent supplied by by solar energy, and that solar energy that we've installed our uh, ourselves, and and the profits from the solar energy actually go to the community. And interestingly, we've just restocked the school library with books as as a direct result of the profits that have come out of the solar energy. You know, and that that also talks about the story of you know. Who, who we're about. And now when I say who, I'm talking about the partnership of who we're about. You know, if this isn't just environmental, this is a commitment to employees, it's a commitment to the, to the community. And it's a very deep set values of both organized organizations of who we are and what we stand for. Thank you very much. And if you haven't downloaded the report, please go to positiveluxury.com and download the report because you will see many more case studies that also like a, what are the five things that you need to do in order to find your perfect match? Because this is a, it's like falling in love, you know? You can 
you can uh, try many, many times, but then when you find the right partner, you stick to, to, to that person or, or to that company and you develop that relationship. And, you know, there is right now this, uh, this trend about setting targets with your suppliers. So it becomes one single target. So together you can achieve net zero and how you can actually help co-create and co-develop these, um, these strategies together and like I said a little bit a little bit in the beginning is about internalizing your externalities because this cannot sit anymore somewhere in scope three this needs to be part of your scopes um but I, I I'll pass I'd like to well we are almost on time before we open the phone to Q and A's and I'd like to give a, a little bit of time to to Martin because you know you work with many 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 brands uh, the BSI is setting standard like the ISO certifications and so on. You just have a, a purpose certification as well. Um, so what advice would you give brands and suppliers to foster a culture of collaboration? Because I think it's very important, the culture of collaboration. And also, if you can talk about, you know, I mean, what is the role of certifications in all of this? Because, I mean, um, it's great and good to say whatever, but the point is, how is this governed? So uh, the floor is over to you, Martin. Thank you. You ask the really big questions, don't you? You don't, you don't muck around with the small ones. Um, so um, how do we talk about collaboration? I, I suppose there's quite a lot of learning points here. Um, and I, I, if we go back a little bit in time, so... BSI wrote um, collaborative working standard um, back in, I think it was about 2006. And I think since we've published that standard, th there's a lot of learning that we can help people with, um, as we've heard um, already today, about how do you effectively collaborate? And that, I think, um, starts with knowledge. How do we create um, effective strategies which are business objectives to collaborate? If we look at a post-pandemic world, I think more organisations are now talking about collaboration and are collaborating than ever before. Um, companies, I think, historically have thought about mergers and acquisitions. But I think the climate of business now is very much about collaboration. And we can talk a little bit about purpose-driven businesses, but I'll come back to that. Fundamental to getting it right, and we've heard a great case study already today, is about how do I select the right partner? How do I make sure if we're gonna create a relationship which has value, that you take time thinking about who am I gonna partner with? Because if you don't invest that time at the start, I don't think you're gonna get it right. Then it's about investing time along that process, about working together. That's about having joint governance. It's about making sure that you continually discuss, review, and have that honesty in the conversation to be successful. Fundamental, and this comes back a little bit to something was we've been talking about already. How do you, as a collaborative way of working, create value? This isn't just about a task, a project. How do two organizations, when they do something that that one organization can't do, how do you create value? And then, the two other elements are when you've actually delivered something, do you stay together? Is this collaboration beyond a project or is there a point at which you need to think about an exit strategy? So once you've actually delivered what you wanted to do in a collaborative way, is it just a project or is this actually a partner which, to use your example, it's a marriage that will go on and on forever? So I think it's about having that knowledge about your business strategy selecting your partner, working together, creating value beyond what a single organization can do, staying together and working through the hard times and understanding, do you actually leave that relationship or do you stick with that relationship and make it work? If we look at those areas, there's some really interesting kind of work going on now in the marketplace. Let me just kind of throw an example at you. Um, this comes from a conversation this morning. When we start to look at certification sometimes, we look at businesses being certified. So we might look at environmental management system for a business. The conversation, which I think is fascinating from this morning that I've had is, should we see collaboration? Should we see business models around projects? So if we're looking at 
developing, um, I don't know, a road or a new product, actually we should be applying some of the standards to the collaboration, not to the individual organization. So I think business models are changing. And mm -hmm. I think that comes back to your very subtle hint about purpose-driven businesses. Why do we exist and what are we trying to do? And we've written a standard which we're publishing in April called um, Purpose-Driven Organizations, which is what is the core purpose of a business and what are you trying to achieve with your shareholders and your stakeholders? Yeah. And when you were phrasing this, and I think it Phil was talking at the time, I was writing down that if you look at what Phil uh, has achieved, you, you've got environmental capital, you've got social capital, you've got human capital, and you've got kind of um, innovation capital. That's about businesses really creating a brand that drives change in a way that works with shareholders and stakeholders, works with the staff in a business, but creates new knowledge and does yeah. it in a socially and environmentally acceptable way. Absolutely. That's a no, so, that's really good. And, and But this is why ESG is so important because it encompasses yeah. all of it. And the ESG plus, you have the innovations as well. Yeah. And, you know, in our, um, in our predictions report, uh, we had a really interesting insight which stuck to me, which is uh, brands, especially the ones that have history and they didn't have that purpose in the very beginning, just, just to have the purpose of the, of the company, but not a purpose beyond profit. Um, uh, brands seek f purpose, but people, consumers seek trust. So it's not about having a purpose statement written somewhere or having a certification for it. It's about how do you leave it? How do you deliver it every single day into your value proposition, into your product, into when you pick up that bottle of Renard and you look at, okay, you tell me of the story all the way throughout. So I think this is very important not to get caught up into having a mission statement or having a purpose statement somewhere, but how do you actually live it? So we as consumers can see it. I don't know, what's your experience on that? And then we'll jump on Q&As. I, to be honest, I actually think transparency and honesty yeah. are the values that consumers are looking for now. And it's okay for you to say, we said we were going to do this, but we haven't actually succeeded yet. Being honest is, is an incredibly important brand value now. Consumers, I actually see to be more change agents for businesses than they have, ever have before. And, and actually, they will walk away. They will jump on social media and they will explain to people what's going on rather than what's being perceived so i think you're right thank you i mean um phil this is a question for you i'm going to start opening q a's because i just realized that we are running out of time in your experience will customer pay more and wait longer for uh high quality sustainable materials the i i think it probably goes back to some of the points that, that martin was uh, was talking about in terms of the, you know, being transparent and being honest about the authenticity of a product and being able to really understand where that product has come from, you know, brings a real value. So it's, yeah, this isn't just having a sustainable uh, packaging as we're talking about today. This is a whole, it's, it's the champagne, it's the origin of the champagne, it's what the brand stands for, it's the packaging that it's in. And that drives a, a, a value for, uh, for the product. You know, it's important to understand you know, where has the packaging come from. You know, and ours, for example, it, it comes from uh, you know, FSC certified and uh, an authenticated forestry. And ev for every one tree that is used, two trees are planted. Uh, so it's a sustainable process as uh, as it's going through. And having, I think, you know, just to choose that word of transparency, but having that and being and being front and forward about you know what the product is where it stands for is is truly driving value so you know i wouldn't necessarily put a put, put a price on this other, other than you know there is there's a generation today uh that are far more discerning than the, than there was in uh, in in the past and are making their buying decisions based on the authenticity of some of the products that they see sustainability is more important than it was the social aspect is more important than it was the environmental impact is is more important than it was and i think what is good to see 
of you know the partnership that we're talking about today is we've got you know two companies today who have been valuing those sorts of aspects for for many many years and are now are taking a very long term view and going back to the point that Martin uh, Martin made and I think this is one of the differences is you know how far out do we look we we wouldn't have done seven versions of this we wouldn't have waited two two years for for doing this but you know if we if we hadn't been thinking long term and also more importantly thinking about what is the right thing to do to to get this right to tra put transparency in terms of the product that we're producing and provide something that is fit for purpose in terms of the luxury item that uh, that we're supporting Thank you very much. I mean, this is a question uh, for Frederick. Um, uh, Sandra's asking, uh, what about the use of water when you talked about, you know, the regenerative side in the vineyards and so on? Uh, what about the use of water, especially during the years when vineyards need to be irrigated? Well, you know, by law, you cannot irrigate in Champagne. So there is no, you know, there is no question whether, you know, we are using water that, you know, too much water that we should leave for, for better usage. We have no right to do that. So actually the, the challenge in Champagne is more that we are, the, uh, you know, the more northern um, vineyard in the world. So we are facing um, cold weather. We are facing sometimes too much water. Uh, so that, that is more the, the concern we have. And uh, actually, the, the, the increasing challenge is the, the temperature, the average temperature. You know, it, it did raise by uh, more than one degree in the past uh, 30 years, and it's completely changing the style of our wine. So this is a challenge. But the water is not so much, uh, you know, uh, or definitely irrigating is not a challenge. We cannot and we don't need anyway. Uh, but it's the maturity of the wine with the uh, warming climate. Thank you. Um, Phil, this is for you. Um, what do you think could be the next gen packaging solution, not only materials wise, for luxury fashion brands to reduce the high amount of annual production without losing the luxury uh, experience of unwrapping, um, which will be true absolute reduction? Well, let me talk about a couple of couple of trends of areas that uh, that we're working on at uh, at the moment and. You know, color is uh, is an area. So you know, we're producing uh, colored molded fiber as well to really differentiate the the product. And what's important is, you know, again, it's mineral based. It has to be repurposable, recyclable, and from from a sustainable source. But then we sort of think a bit uh, longer term as well. So whereas we're using virgin pulp from FSC uh, source forestry, what we also uh, are looking at is, you know. How do we repurpose material or recycle material that would have gone to landfill? And I'll give you uh, give you another example here. So uh, we we manufacture the paper that goes into uh, into the Burberry bags. Now, interestingly, you know, fifty percent of that product is actually made from used coffee cups, and we've uh, we have our own recycling center on site where we're taking material in for people like McDonald's and Costa Coffee and so on that would go into landfill because it's uh, or, or incinerated. And what we're looking for is a new lease of life of products that would move into, into those areas. So, you know, what we would call, you know, post-consumer waste. And more importantly is once we've provided a new life to that product, then it can go on after that to be recycled and repurposed again into, uh, into different products. So we're seeing a number of trends in, in this area and, and it's taking... Uh, an environmental standard and going way beyond and above where uh, where it can go. But it comes back to also some of the points that both Frederick and, and I made earlier. It's it's also about the design, mm. and you know this is a it's a point of sale item, so it's having a, a beautiful luxury point of sale item with fantastic environmental credentials with it as uh, as well. Thank you very I, I much. Sorry. I was going to just say the word we haven't mentioned yet is circularity, which I think if we're thinking about how we understand the changing need of the consumer is how do we design to reuse, to remanufacture the components that are going into the supply chain? And I think that's going to become, you know, going back to your very first question, I think circularity is going to become an incredibly important part of the supply chain in terms of how do we design to get it right at the start. 
rather than actually do the linear economy of, you know, take, make, dispose. Mm -hmm. um, thank you very much. And I actually have a question for you. How important will traceability become for luxury brands from big to small? And will consumers really have the power to influence brands on where they have their products and from where they source their materials? Always small questions. Brilliant, Brilliant question. Um, let me kind of... I'm going to share with you a bit of a vision I've got, I suppose. Um, it goes back to when you asked me the first question about what are the trends, and I went, it's business to business to consumer. What we really need to do is get that traceability and transparency. And if I kind of, the vision I've got is that a consumer will look at a product, they will be able to either scan that product or look at the QR tag, and it will tell them where that product's made, are there any modern slavery in the supply chain? What the energy consumption is? Are, is that organization net zero? So as a consumer, they will be able to make choices about purchasing that product. We're starting to see that with some of the big brands already starting to create green marketplaces where the data related to a product is becoming more accessible to people. And I think if the consumer has access to that information and that information is presented in the right way, the consumer will really drive that tr uh, that trend, I suppose, about traceability. Because if we aren't, if we don't get that traceability right, if we don't get that transparency right, we're actually fueling bad behaviour of the corporate, of individuals in terms of decisions they make. So I think that transparency issue, that traceability issue, is going to become a big issue in the next five years. Thank you. That's the short answer to a long question. So I'm. Um Frederick, which advice would you be would you give people, either companies or suppliers, uh, to actually have a successful partnership uh, like you had with uh, James Cropper? Mm. No pressure. Yeah, no pressure. I think you have to be you have to be clear in your vision and on, on, on stick to it, which is not easy. There is every single day you have bump in the road, uh, all the reason not to, you know, to do compromise and not to stick to what you, uh, to what you want. So, so all the partners, I mean, we, we, we certainly succeeded extremely well with, uh, with uh, James Cropper on, on this very difficult project. But I would say that I don't think we have one single partner that we work with that we are not uh, convinced of his values and, and, and that we are along the same road. Uh, we, we never do, or, or I should maybe not say, say never, but we, we try to always um, uh, avoid to work with people on a one project and there is no you know, midterm uh, mid uh, uh, road to, between us. So I think it's really, for me, it's all about that. I mean, if we have the same values, we'll find a way. If you have different values, you know, it's a short-term uh, uh, project with no meaning. And, and I take this opportunity to answer to two questions, which I find very important. FSC decision, you know, was way, way before this project. Actually, since more than 10 years, we only use FSC um, uh, uh, forest uh, uh, sourcing. And the last on, on the glass, the glass is, is, is very tricky. And, and where partnership we, you know, will need to be is very tricky. Uh, uh, it's the first uh, reason for emission. We, always, uh, we already used about 80% of reused glasses, but in order to succeed in reducing and, uh, and reducing carbon footprint is a very difficult project. Uh, they use a lot of energy and you know, a new partnership is, is ahead of us. Thank you very much. And the same question goes to you, Phil. I mean, what is the secret of a successful partnership with brands? And also, while you're there, uh, there's an interesting question from Alicia that says, I mean, how would a small brand or a startup, which have sometimes very little money, can actually influence suppliers? So, again, no pressure. I think... Um... No, I'm not going to just repeat what was said because I, I totally agree. The, the, there has to be an alignment of values because you know, we're working on long-term projects and if that, if that doesn't work, then you know, the, the project ultimately isn't going to work. And we, like, uh, like Runard 
you know we don't believe in doing one-off short-term uh, short-term projects but you know um so we talked about transparency of product uh, we, i also would introduce transparency of partnership as uh, as well um things uh many things go wrong when you're developing a product and and to have a, a very open and honest discussion with your with your partner of what works and what uh, and what doesn't work and then and then also that spirit of challenging as uh, as well and i think what you've created in uh, you know together with um with this product is something that is truly groundbreaking that i would say that neither one of the companies would have achieved had we not been working very closely together and really understanding what was feasible and challenging each other as uh, as well so it's that open honest trusting relationship which at the heart of that sits you know the purpose of both companies and the and the value of uh, the values those companies uh, have um you know the covid has been a, a challenge uh, over the past two years but to have some of that face to face look see smell and feel about what to the other's organization is is like is uh, is also really important as uh, as well um in terms of Dan, Dan, just repeat the second question, if you will, please. Um, the question is, how can small companies with sometimes not great financial access can influence suppliers? Okay. Well, we, we work a lot with, uh, with small companies and, and startup companies as, uh, as well. And I think um, you know, it, it can't be exclusive just working with very large brands although clearly you know, that's something that we uh, that we do but not exclusively um, it's important for particularly around innovation to be working with a whole variety of brands and, and, and startup brands as, uh, as as well and and I think again it, you know, it has, this has to be in the spirit of looking long term and you know and if a startup brand is going to to launch and develop if we are part of that from the very early days and onset we can help to support and help that brand you know build and grow to uh, you know to start to deliver on their on their aspirations so i mean my recommendation is is to be there on the onset you know think about what's feasible think about what's uh, what's practical work work with the right uh, supplier um, customer relationship and make sure that chemistry uh, chemistry works but i think any any good supplier will not be filtering opportunities just on the basis of size, particularly if you look long term. Um, so be there on the beginning, um, you know, work on the onset and, and help help each other to to help to deliver of what's feasible of that uh, of that startup. I would Thank I would add to that Colour Colour Form itself is a startup. You know, we we've been uh, as a company we've been going for two hundred years, but Colour Form has actually only been going for but now we're actually in our fifth year now, um, you know, and, uh, you know, and if we weren't in the spirit of innovation and driving a startup business, then, you know, we, we wouldn't have colour form here today. So, you know, it has to sit at the heart of things that we're doing. Innovation, put some changes out there, be disruptive. Thank you. Martin, last word with you. Um, I mean, which advice would you, be, would you give suppliers and companies to actually have a successful partnership uh, going fo forward? I think it's about uh, the words honesty. If you develop a, a relationship, it's about that collaboration. It's about the honesty. It is about working together. So it's not about seeing a supplier as somebody you have a contract with. It's a partner that you're trying to really drive change. And that's about shared work around innovation. That's about shared risk. That's about shared reward. I think those kind of business models are changing the way we do business now because we're thinking about relationships in a very, very different way. And I think that requires us to be brave. That requires us to be uh, honest with each other in terms of where things are working, where they're not. But if you get that right, it scales and it helps businesses and it changes the culture of an organization. Thank you. Well, you heard it here, trust, collaboration, honesty, 
Uh, and there is nothing like failure. You have to keep trying until you get it right, even if it's for two years and you have a fantastic product. So thank you very much, uh, Phil, Frederick and Martin for your time. And thank you everybody for tuning in. And uh, we'll see you uh, next month. Um, so thank you again and have a fantastic afternoon. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.